Hello and welcome to this online lecture for Core 109 Communication and Thought. In this lecture, we would like to demonstrate two processes that will give you some practical help for your Task 2 assignment. They are critical thinking and extrapolation, and I will explain what they are and how to use them to help you think about, research and write your Task 2 essay or report. Finally, at the end of the lecture, I will briefly step you through how to access, save or print your online feedback from Task 1B in order to maximise your marks for Task 2. So students who scored well on Task 1 often demonstrated critical thinking. They gathered evidence, they evaluated their thinking and that evidence. They analysed or pulled apart information into its separate components and synthesised or looked for what fit together, what the links were. So what is critical thinking and how can you use critical thinking for task two? We're going to begin with a definition. Critical thinking involves mentally considering the evidence and information determining the reliability and relevance of that information and making a reasoned judgement and applying that judgement. When I look at that definition, I see three processes there. Mentally considering the evidence and information, determining whether that information is reliable and relevant, and then making and applying a reasoned judgement. So, let's give you some practical help with actually engaging in critical thinking for task two. Mentally considering the information means to stop and consider what you already know. What do you know from personal experience? What have you heard in lectures or classes? Or what have you read? So what is it you already know about your task two topic? In week five, you engaged in a focused brainstorming exercise. Go back and take a look at what you wrote down in that exercise. So who did you identify as the most likely personal people you would communicate with in your field? And what was the goal or the purpose of that communication? What outcome are you trying to achieve? Considering such information will help you to save yourself time, effort and frustration in the research process for task two. Remember, Although brainstorming is useful for coming up with preliminary ideas and information, this is not credible as it is, and you have to provide evidence for your ideas. So, as well as mentally considering information that you might already possess, you now need to consider the evidence and what you have read. And you do this to demonstrate that to your marker that you understand the evidence and that you can determine if it's relevant or not to the point you are making. So let's unpack this definition using an example. So we're going to use an example from Baker et al, a source we used in task 1b. This sentence is quite complex and it has a lot of ideas in it and it can be difficult to use it well and demonstrate understanding. As I read it and mentally consider it, I realise that I do understand quite a bit of it but I'm not really sure what binds organisational goals with continuity and fluidity actually means. It would be a mistake to try and put that into my assignment if I don't understand it, and it would be very difficult to paraphrase it if I don't understand it. So in considering it, I realise that I do actually know some things. I know that bind means to keep together or to combine. And from a dictionary, I work out that continuity is a continuous operation with no breaks or interruptions, and fluidity is being able to move quickly, to change easily and adapt. So if I put those ideas together, I can come up with a beginning paraphrase that might read, feedback combines the organisation's goals with an uninterrupted and flexible process. That's not bad, but it's a little awkward, so I'm going to refine it and I might come up with something better. Feedback assists an organisation to move towards its goals in a flexible and uninterrupted manner. Engaging in this process has helped me to mentally consider the evidence and what I'm reading and to understand it and to find a way to demonstrate my understanding to my marker in that paraphrase. 
So the next process, after mentally considering information and evidence, is to think about the reliability and relevance of the information. In terms of reliability, this is why it is important to use academic texts and peer-reviewed journal articles, because we know they're reliable. But in terms of de determining your relevance, this is where you decide what you should include in your assignment and what you should leave out. As you research, you may come across some great information, but you cannot include it all. So critical analysis is about what you leave out as well as what you choose to include. You need to use the information which best answers the assignment question or best advances your argument or persuasion. So back to Baker et al. How do I determine what is relevant in this quote? I don't need to use the whole sentence, and I'm not misrepresenting the author, if I pick parts of it but don't change the meaning overall. What information is most relevant to my argument? Out of the four main benefits in that text, I have to decide which one suits me. And assisting with organisational goals might be relevant if my field is uh, in a large organisation or a business, a school or a hospital. Boosting creativity might be useful for a graphic designer or other creative industries roles. Propelling trust is relevant to jobs such as a counsellor, a psychologist, social worker, nurse and teacher, but even other areas such as an engineer who wants people to trust in their skills and their judgment. And driving motivation is particularly relevant to areas such as sports exercise, dietitian, a physical trainer, OT, and areas such as that. Okay, we've mentally considered the information and evidence, and we've determined the relevance or otherwise of that information and evidence. Determining the relevance of the information allows you to make a reasoned judgment about what to use or not use from what you have read and then to apply that judgment in a thoughtful manner in how you use the evidence. We are going to look at three examples. Feel free to pause the video and have a think through these examples and see what would be most helpful to you. So this is an example of determining relevance and using judgment for task two in a two-step argument or process. We're going to look at the benefits of feedback in the field of graphic design. We've determined from the source in Baker that the most relevant information was that feedback increases creativity because a graphic designer needs to be creative to develop designs. We already have a source that proves the first part of that argument, that feedback increases creativity. And we've determined that is relevant to us, so now we need to locate a source as evidence for the second part of our argument, that creativity is useful or beneficial for a graphic designer. So rather than searching for graphic design and feedback in a library search, which you might have trouble finding, our search would focus on looking for a source to prove the second part of that argument. The search might be creativity and graphic design, or design and client brief, or client needs and graphic design, and we might write up what we find like this. Feedback is useful for increasing creativity in individuals, Baker et al. 2013, which is vital for the creative designer who must come up with the design ideas to satisfy clients, and that's where our other discipline-specific reference would go. Note, in that two-stage process or argument, we have used two different sources and applied them to where they are relevant. This process is known as extrapolation, and understanding this process can save you a lot of time. So in this case, we've inferred something that was unknown, that feedback is useful for a graphic designer, from something that was known, that creativity is important for a graphic designer and that feedback can lead to increased creativity. The other part of the definition is to draw from specific cases and apply it to more general cases. So let's look at an example which does this. 
So, an example of drawing from a specific case and applying it to other more general cases. We find some evidence from a source that says listening is beneficial in establishing trust. That came from a nursing source, but your field is not nursing. How can you draw from that specific case and apply it to more general cases or to your field? So we've established that trust is important for a nurse, but is trust important in your field? For example, do you need to encourage customer trust in a business or stakeholder trust in a project? You would be looking for discipline specific sources to find evidence that trust is important in your field and why it is important. The evidence from our nursing source showed a very specific benefit of a relaxed and compliant patient. So listening established trust, which led to a more relaxed and compliant patient. You might start thinking about where else a more relaxed and compliant patient or client is useful, such as in counselling fields, social work or other health related fields, paramedicine, OT and physio. In a search, you might look at things like social work and trust, paramedic and patient, engineer and stakeholder confidence, and think about terms which cover the concepts you're considering. The idea here, remember, is to take from a specific source and infer to a more general or um, field-specific example. So one last example which will also demonstrate how a paragraph might be written up using the two types of sources, communication theory and discipline specific theory. We're going to return to our example from tutorials with the skill of assertiveness and the field of geology. So again, if you cannot find a source that specifically links the benefit to the, to the field that you're looking for, then try and engage in a two-step process instead. Break the argument. In the first part, we will use communication theory to claim that assertiveness has a specific outcome or benefit, i.e. that it leads to the open discussion of ideas and concerns. And we're going to reference that from communication theory. Here's a paraphrase of what we have come across. So the second part is going to be a reasoned judgment, a claim that that general benefit or outcome is important in your field, in this case for a geologist. And the second part of the argument needs to be backed up with evidence from your discipline specific theory. In our reading, we did find information on the geologists needing to communicate risk. And it had a link to that idea of open discussion of concerns. This is how we've paraphrased it. Note the link between one set of information and the other and that is that idea of open discussion or effective dialogue. So let's put it all together. This is what a paragraph or section might look like. Note firstly the link between the two sets of ideas, the open discussion of ideas and concerns or effective dialogue, and also that the sources are from two different areas. In brown are the communication theory sources, and those sources are talking about the skill itself, in this case assertiveness, while those sources indicated in green are discipline specific sources and are talking about the field, in this case geology. Just be careful not to, to misrepresent what the author is saying. In our example, one set of sources only talked about the skill, while the other set of sources only talked about the field. So it would not be right to say something such as, risk communication requires open and effective dialogue between all social actors involved in risk situations, so assertiveness is an important skill for a geologist to use, and reference that to de Gullio et al. That's because that source does not actually talk about assertiveness, only about geology. Just to sum up, 
Try to save yourself time and frustration by being selective in your research and looking for relevance. So some things that would help you are to go back to your brainstorm from week five and think about what your communication goals or outcomes are in your field. What are you trying to achieve when you, when you use listening, questioning or feedback with those that you're going to communicate with in your area? As well, use the advanced search feature on the Library Discover layer to help you filter your search results and find more relevant information. And think about different terms you could use, terms that are used in your discipline, such as consultation, interview, assessment, or customer, client relations, stakeholders, handover, negotiations. And as well, think about synonyms for the skills themselves. So instead of feedback, you might search on advice, direction, guidance. Next week's lecture will be back to the regular format and will give you some more very practical and useful tips for how to research for task two. Now another important step in maximising your success in task two is understanding what you were great on and what you needed to improve from task one. A recent study of university students revealed that not all students knew how to access their online marking feedback the first time they had to do so and that it could be a complicated process. So we're going to briefly step you through exactly how to do this. And that research study also noted that students may not always be motivated to access the feedback. That can be understandable with so many time pressures on students, but often correcting a few simple past errors can result in the difference of almost a grade or more, and it's worth the investment of a small amount of your time. So here is how you access your feedback from task 1B. I'm logged into Blackboard and I'm using the Google Chrome browser, which is the best browser for this process. The first step is to access my interim results. That is over on the left hand side here. I can see here the paragraph submission. Yours might be a report. I can see the score and go straight to the rubric. However, it's better to access this link to get your full feedback. I've opened that up to save time. This is what your screen will look like when you click on that link. The middle section here has your document and the comments that your marker has made. Over on the right hand panel is where you access your rubric. We'll be looking at that later so for now, I'm going to collapse that panel and maximize my window. I'm also going to close this comments and markup because it's just easier to see them in the margin here. You'll notice comments and insertion points. Sometimes your comments will be highlighted or there'll be a frame around the text. Hovering over a comment box shows you where that comment belongs and changes that dotted line into a hard line. Don't be worried if you have quite a lot of comments from your marker. They are just trying to give you the best chance to learn how to improve from task 1b and to maximize your marks for task 2. So as well as viewing my marker comments, if I would like to save or print those, this is how I do that. I use the download command at the top here, that little arrow. And when I click that, I'm going to choose download annotated PDF. In Google Chrome, the download appears at the bottom bar here. If you just click that and open it, and it opens in a web browser, Go back and download again and this time right click and ask it to open with the system viewer. In this way it will open up as a PDF document. And you can see here insertion points and comments. Again hovering over the insertion point or the comment box will show the link between them. So if I would like to save or print this, I'm going to choose File, Print. 
In choosing print, it means I can either choose the printer here or I can print to a PDF, which will save the file. The important thing to, to notice here is over on the comments and forms section, I have to choose documents and markups. Sometimes that will just say document on its own and you need to choose documents and markups. As well, at the moment that will print three pages. So if I ask it to summarize the comments, it's now going to print five pages. So what it does, it prints a page that sh shows an insertion point and a number. And the next page will tell you what those comments were with the matching number. So insertion points with numbers are followed with a page that summarizes those comments and has a matching number. We would print this. I'm going to cancel this time. And going back to our original window, now we know how to print or save our comments from our marker. Let's look at the rubric. Let's expand that panel and collapse our window. You access the rubric through this grid icon. This opens up the, the rubric and I can clearly see shaded areas to, to show what grading I have been awarded on each criteria. Sometimes your marker may place extra feedback into that shaded section. But don't forget to scroll right to the end to see what feedback your marker has left for you. So the best way to save or print the rubric is to choose Control P or right click print from this screen. This opens the print dialog box. Again, I can change this and select a printer or I can save it to PDF. The thing that's most important here is to make sure that the layout is on landscape and not portrait. In portrait you will not be able to see all of the rubric detail. In landscape I can now see the rubric but instead of shaded areas determining the grading you look for the bold text. And choosing print will either print that or save that to a file so that I can go back and look later. So accessing your feedback is important for maximising all the marks for task two. And it's a good practice to go back and have a thorough look before you submit your next assignment. Remember that your online feedback is not the only feedback you can have access to. If there is anything you don't understand about your feedback, or you would like to discuss it further or have further clarification, please do contact your tutor. Remember that lectures next week will be back to the normal format, and they will cover help with library searching and also the skills of listening and questioning.